I'm Shalina Tobin, aka Posh Nosh Gal, and today I'm joined by the remarkable chef Taylor Bonnyman. A Londoner at heart, Taylor refined his culinary skills with the likes of Marcus Waring, Daniel Balud, and Paul Liebrand before opening the highly acclaimed and Michelin starred Five Fields restaurant in Chelsea. I'm so excited to be chatting with Taylor. He has quite a reputation for shying away from the limelight. So Taylor, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with me. How are you? Oh, thank you. Um, very well, very well on this gray Friday afternoon. Yes, um, very great. But we're all fine. We're all fine, thank you. And hopefully we're coming out the other end now, but how was your time over lockdown? And tell me about how you felt when you heard of the news of closures. Um, I, to be honest, I, uh, when they uh, advised everyone to stay away from restaurants a week before, uh, that was worse than the actual enforced closure because it was there was no there was no support there was nothing and we just saw the the reservations just um, you know going into freefall. Um, so there was a bit of a there was a bit of open water to cover there between the first um, you know admonition and then uh, the actual. Uh, you know, legal requirement to close. That was hard. But, you know, the actual, uh, the actual lockdown itself, the novelty wore off pretty quickly. I'm sure it did for many people. Um, scary times, really. Um, but, you know, we, we, we opened at the beginning of August and, uh, you know, it was going really well. The goalposts have been slightly changed with the uh, curfew. We'll see how that goes. Um, it makes it quite difficult. I'm not gonna, not gonna lie. Uh, so fingers crossed we can get through, and hopefully they'll lift it sooner rather than later. And and how much how much of a difference does that one hour make to you? Well, it's a couple of hours, isn't it? I mean, you'd normally finish at twelve. Yeah. Or 11 well, without a without a limit, we can take reservations up till ten o'clock. Yeah. Um, when we came back, we knew we weren't going to have as many customers. So we changed our whole business plan from being an a la carte and tasting restaurant, which requires more, more personnel. Uh, so we, 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 we lost a few personnel. We went to one menu only, uh, tasting menu, which takes longer. Um, but you, can't, you, you rely on you know, getting people in over the course of the evening. Now we have to get them all in either at once. It's like the McAllister family leaving for Christmas. It's complete chaos yeah, uh, at 9.59. Um, it, it makes it pretty rough and no one really wants to, no one wants to eat at 5.30 um, unless it's, you know, the weekend and even then it's, you know, rare. So it is, I mean, it's, it's tough for us. I'm sure it's even rougher for other restaurants out there. Yeah. So because yeah. it takes two and a half hours to, to eat, but we've had to modify the menu again so that people can get out in two hours. Our last sitting is eight o'clock, which, which is you know, really tough. Yeah, yeah. And obviously, I mean, your restaurant, it, it, it is an experience. So it's not a place where you want to, you want to just eat and go. You, you want to enjoy it and take your time. Yeah, well, hopefully, you know, that, that's the food and the, service is is one thing is making people feel very special um but you know the quality of food should be implicit um but people come to have a good time with their company and uh we're just there to kind of facilitate that and hopefully entertain you along the way but we're not you know we've never tried to be the stars of the show just something that can enhance someone's evening yeah cool. um so. and and going going back to just over you know what you did over lockdown did you um spend any time near your vegetable gardens in sussex that's where we stayed we we, we got out before they uh they they pulled up the bridges and uh so we were down there living with my parents for two months which was um wow that must have been interesting. Nice. <laughs> it was very nice we we didn't we weren't invited so we just showed up so <laughs> i'll bite my tongue it was probably wasn't great for them either well, if you can't do that with your parents, then who can you do it with, right? They're probably no, exactly. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was pretty rough, but we came back. We came back sort of the end of June, um, and it was it was gorgeous. It was, you know, the tough part was keeping our three-year-old twins occupied, and 
you know, like like so like like everyone who has small children, it it, it is a grind. Like just getting through the day sometimes. Yeah. And uh, you know, I do I do sympathise with anyone who had to also work, um, or had a partner who had to work. At least you know we weren't. I wasn't doing anything, but we got to see the change in the seasons, and um, they got to you know experience the garden as as living in London. They haven't really seen that. Um, so, and they, you know, were too young before. So that was nice. Yeah. And, and you've got three, you've got three acres out there. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Roughly, roughly. Yeah. And, and so the gardens is, it supplies the restaurant. Yes. Yeah. So we, we've, we've, because again, because the menus, menus had to adapt, uh, we're, we're, Basically, we're using the, the garden as the starting point for everything, really. Uh, we've even started uh, shooting the deer um, that, that kind of, you know, uh, gather at the periphery on my, in my parents' fields. So wow. we're getting quite a few deer from there as well, uh, which, which is fantastic. So, yeah, you know, amazing. I'm not sure that I'd be able to pick out a, uh, an East Sussex deer from my parents' land. <laughs> as opposed to another one but it is lovely you know when you're so when you're you serving something up, did you grow up shooting no I, I i haven't i haven't shot a thing but i really i really ought to give it a give it a whirl and i, I have no qualms about shooting something to eat it um okay. but uh may, maybe maybe some practice targets before i start <laughs> blasting the countryside <laughs> yeah <laughs> So what was it that inspired you to, to, to start and develop your own garden? Um, when I was working in New York, we used to go to the green market a couple times a week. And, you know, I worked with a, you know, worked with a guy called Paul Liebrandt out there who, who was very, very into, you know, the, these, these, you know, unusual herbs, um, shoots, vegetables, and, uh, and deploying them you know, with devastating effect, you know, just, you know, it, it, it lightened his food and it was, it was gorgeous. Um, and I'd never seen any of that in London. Um, perhaps, perhaps Tom Akins was, was doing a little bit, um, but, uh, you know, with his, with his little roof garden when it was still up on Elliston street, but, uh, we, um, it was really more about sourcing, good stuff so we thought the only really effective way to do that was to grow it ourselves and now it's now it's grown into much more than just a kind of herb and micros garden it sits and you know, it, it we grow an enormous amount of vegetables david uh, david love cameron our gardener gets a, a, an awful lot of produce out of that acreage um he used to have a walled garden uh, back in ireland um, from which he was supplying lots of restaurants and he does it by himself it's it's amazing really um, so we give him a kind of uh, a very broad brushstroke menu plan at the beginning of the year we kind of like to try this this and this we really like this we didn't like this uh, this worked out for us this not so much and then he, he'll put it into his into his planting uh, and garden plan and uh, yeah, so gives us a a month's heads up uh as to when we should expect stuff the real tragedy was this summer we had to we had to it's not a tragedy but we we couldn't use any of it fresh we had to um move quite quickly to preserve and juice and you know, you know process all of this stuff that was coming in in in, in droves uh and with no restaurant yeah so, <laughs> so that was a bit of a shame how did you how did you manage i mean what did you do with it well, um, we get a lot of brassicas, so, you know, summer cabbages, kohlrabis, yeah. beetroots. So you know, we, we, some of the vegetables we cure, so you're essentially burying them in salt and sugar and, you know, drawing them out, treating them like a piece of meat, almost like jerky. Some of them we juice, use the, you know, ferment the juice and you kind of replace, you know, what, what you might conventionally use vinegar or lemon juice for with vegetable juice which which adds you know a, um, greater complexity lactic acid is a lot softer um, creamier and more savory than citric or acetic acid 
Um, so it's, re it's really good for finishing and you, you, it's a bit more forgiving as well because you can, you can add a bit more without destroying your source at the, at the point of sending it in service. So it's, um, yeah, it's quite a handy little, handy little store cupboard things. And obviously a lot of fermenting things, uh, which, which, which is, which is handy just to bring a bit of acidity and freshness to uh, yeah. what we're doing. Well, that's great that you're still managing to, you know, you, you managed to use the produce and, you know, having your own gardens is, it's that's such a good business strategy and you get to save, you get to probably save so much money on certain products. Um, we came to the restaurant, your team explained that each year you have an away day there. Yeah, we missed it this year, of course. Oh, yeah, okay. But yeah, yeah, norm normally we normally we go down and um, last year, 2019, we had a, you know, a little food truck came up and uh, we just had a just had a party and uh, so much all, fun, yeah. Yeah, it was great. All the guys got to walk around the garden and yeah, it's nice to get out of London as well. Apart from anything else, it's just it, it it's nice to see where we're getting all this stuff, but it's not a it's not a kind of research field trip it's uh it's kind of downtime and uh it is their weekend of course so. yeah. but it's nice it's love it's a lovely spot yeah and um and so did you did you manage to retain most of your staff yes so we had we we, we lost one of our guys upstairs just yeah we we, we hand our hand was forced but we had furloughed him and we made sure that he was okay and had found other employment. One guy downstairs had already given his notice. We were able to furlough him because he hadn't been in his other, you know, new job for long enough to be eligible. So we helped him out. And uh, unfortunately three uh, short term hires downstairs, we, we couldn't bring back. They, they'd only just started in, in the month right before. Uh, the furlough scheme was introduced so all, all in we lost five okay. um so uh, it's it's a you know a, a depleted but we we have a good staff retention anyway yeah. uh and it's not the way i'd have it but we just you know the the, the numbers don't really they don't lie <laughs> so we've got we had to make uh, adjustments quite quickly of course um so going back to the restaurant i mean my husband and i we we as I mentioned earlier, we've been there and I thoroughly uh, enjoyed our experience. It's probably one of the most beautiful looking meals that we've ever had. And uh, you love working with flowers as well. And you also grow your own flowers in the garden. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, every, every, the other, the other great thing about growing everything yourself is you, you see that the entire plant, you've got the root, stem, mm. petioles, you know, tendrils, uh, flowers seeds and also you know stuff that you, you you just it's very difficult to get hold of these you know green spices while they're still juicy it's a very um, narrow window green coriander seeds green fennel um uh green caraway um so you you you, you get to see the whole life cycle of the plant and you can use different bits at different times um accordingly and it's taken a long time for us to learn when to be prepared for that because it, it is so brief and uh, you know these ephemeral um changes uh it, it's nice to respond to and, and if you if you can get get yourself ready and prepare a good dish where it, where it would be suitable then it's you know, it's a dream but it takes it takes a long it takes a long a few growing seasons to course, get ready for that and you touched on the menu earlier on. How much does the garden drive your choice of menu? Now it, it, it determines everything that we do. Um, I, I'm not a vegetarian at all. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a total omnivore. Um, but I do now. I like to we structure the menu the way, the way we like to eat, really. We like to finish with a, with a, with a, a, a meat protein mm -hmm. um, and but but leading up to that lots of lots of vegetables seasoned with meat and fish really that's kind of how we go about it is we cook and we garnish with the proteins yeah. rather than the other way around yeah. um, and we you know it makes you it makes you work really hard we don't we don't have that many courses on our menu because we like 
even before the curfew, we don't want people to have to spend more than two and a half hours sitting if they don't want to. You know, you're welcome to stay as long as you like in normal times, but uh, you know, it shouldn't be a four and a half, five hour marathon. You just get a sore back, as, <laughs> as you said, if you're sitting there. <laughs> um, so you kind of work hard to just showcase the stuff that you're getting from your garden. It's, it's also hard in central London to give a lot of meaning to what you're doing when it's coming from 40 miles away. It's not like you can see the garden out the window. So we try and do our best to make a fuss right. um, of this, of this stuff. Cause it is good. And, you know, sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't, but you know, we, try our best and uh, try and give it, give it a voice and uh, make, it, uh, make it all make sense. You were quite young when you opened the Five Fields. You were just in your 20s. What was it that, that made you open such a classic fine dining restaurant? Um, yeah, I was 27, uh, which, which is, I'm, I'm 34 now. Uh, and I, I, I just, I can't believe, you know, 27 is very young, I realize now. Um, but I think, I think we want, I wanted something timeless because, and I'm grateful now that I really didn't know what I was doing because, you know, we weren't, we have, we've never been confined by a kind of fashion or a trend it is quite, uh, you've seen yourself, it's relatively timeless. It's a very orthodox, um, quite a formal restaurant. Um, although we try and make the service as professional but informal as we can. Yeah. Um, you know, serious food cooked by very unserious people. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we've grown into the restaurant. Uh, whereas at the start, of it, obviously, uh, like anyone who opens a restaurant for the first time, you don't really know what you're doing at all. And <laughs> it's just everything, in your, nothing in your head really belongs together um, yeah. and trying to, you know, you, you do have to just get on with it and cook. And some people, some people obviously take to it quickly for us. It took a little longer um, and uh, two and a half, three years in, I think we sort of found our stride, uh, but it took a long time. Like, teaching ourselves learning how to cook the way we wanted to. I mean, it was, a, it was a very big step for you at the time, given that you hadn't even, you hadn't spent any time as a head chef yourself before. No, I mean, it was, it, it was a little, it was a little unexpected. Like, we, we were looking for a property. And I think you know, that the, the assumption was that that would take, you know, a year, two years. And, you know, in the meantime, I'd, I'd be kind of, doing what I'd always done, but, but um, yeah, trying to find finishing schools in a way uh, to continue working. But I think it took 48 hours to find, <laughs> to find wow. this building. <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, plan, again, plans change quickly. And uh, I'm glad I didn't know uh, then what I now know about opening a <laughs> restaurant and operating one, because, uh, I think I probably I'd, I'd have shied away from it. It's it's uh, it's something you you should do kind of half blind uh, and, and slightly ignorant of of how much it's going to consume your life. Well, it took something like two years to actually build the property in the first place, and and during that time, you worked in New York with Daniel Belud and and Paul Liebrandt. Um So how did you manage to um, the, you know manage the project remotely? No, I'd actually come back from New York and I, 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 was, I, was planning, I was planning what to do next. Uh, and I thought I might go back out to the US. Actually, I, I think I, I was, um, I'd lined up a trial at, um, you know, for some reason, at Joel Robuchon out in Las Vegas. And I'm not sure I would have come back. From that. <laughs> uh, certainly not the same person, but... Um, <laughs> No, I had to, I, I, I canceled that. So, um, no, I, I'd come back. So the, the, the next two years was me trying to assume some gravitas as a, you know, 
uh, you know, auditing these project manager meetings and trying to throw some kind of sensible insight into like how to put together a restaurant and actually just not knowing what the hell was going on. Before we dive into that, I just actually wanted to just talk about your time in New York and um, your experience working with such culinary royalty. Uh, do you have any, like any fun encounters from your time in New York? Um, I, I mean, yeah, I, New York was amazing. It was, uh, it was uh, the, the, the most formative period of my life not just cooking I, I met my wife there um and uh, it just the whole the whole thing for that for the age i was uh was uh, a tremendous education just uh, an extraordinary city great people a great industry uh the hospitality industry out, out, out in the u.s is uh, is really open really affable and yeah they're just excited to see one another at, uh, at, at um, you know, their uh, colleagues' establishments. So that was great. Um, and uh, yeah, I ended up working for some interesting people. I, you know, when I was at Daniel's, like, you know, the, the, the pastry chef there was Dominic Ansel. So oh. I, 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 you know, had, had, was working in the hot kitchen and I asked to transfer to the pastry. He, had, he hadn't done any of his uh, bakery stuff yet. He was still very much under the Dynex group oh. uh, umbrella. So yeah, he, he, was, a, he was a fun guy. Um, and uh, yeah, his desserts were wonderful. But I, 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 it, now that I think about it, it, it there, there were, it was not just one menu, there was like a, a fruit dessert menu and there were six desserts on that. And then there was a chocolate dessert menu and there were five desserts on that. It was, oh, wow. it was, it was, a, it was a huge, it was a huge operation. Uh, so I was lucky to be there, and I, I met some interesting people in in both restaurants uh, at uh, Corton. Do you still and, have and, a um, a relationship with Dominique? I don't. I'd love to see him. He probably wouldn't remember me though. Um, <laughs> yeah, probably just that 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 weird that weird clueless English guy who <laughs> you know, talked a lot. <laughs> So, so did you? So, did you end up getting transferred then? And how much? How much did you actually learn from? From I mean, did you learn from him, or did you just like pick up stuff together? How how did it work? Well, I I I I I, I did transfer in the kitchen um, because I love the I love the desserts. Them, the huge. It still is a gaping chasm in my, you know knowledge is is pastry fortunately here we've got um van our pastry chef is uh you know doing doing marvelously but um it's uh you know i, I deliberately wanted to at least you know, kind of plug that hole um and uh, and learn a bit so i was there for six months right. and uh you know in in the production side of it i did a little bit of service as well but the production was really kind of where where you kind of the the the, the work happens and you know services you're just sending it out really right particularly particularly for that menu and, and did you did you spend any time with daniel balud or or paul well he's uh he, he's a he was even then he was at a different point in his career you know he, he was not he, he was there a lot but he's a you know, he's a, he was a restaurateur, uh, the face of this huge group of restaurants. So he had he had, he had uh, other things to do than uh, kind of you know hang out with us. But I did see him quite a bit. Very nice guy, right. total right. wild man. I, he uh, he, um, I spoke to him a little bit just just kind of in passing. But um, right. you know, he, uh, he he definitely made an effort to uh, find out about everyone who was working in the kitchen. And there was, you know, he came, came to people's leaving drinks and stuff. And yeah, he'd be, he'd be the first person up on the bar with, you know, mixers like lightly. Awesome. <laughs> no, he's a complete madman. A really Did nice that guy. Did with you? Did he have the mixers with you when you were leaving? No, no, no. no I was, I was uh, a far too marginal minor character in the, uh, in the, in the brigade to, um, you know, merit, merit a, a visit to my leaving, <laughs> my leaving drinks. And so, I mean, 
with your with your with your work now, I mean, I can see inspiration from Paul Stahl in your presentation and um, creating beautiful plates. But it seems like you add much more complexity to the dish. Oh, well, that's that's very kind of you to say. I I, I think uh, yeah, Paul Paul Liebrands, uh, he's he's out there by himself. He's um, yeah more divisive. I, I think probably. Uh, he would uh, he would frown on some of the orthodoxy that we adhere to here. I think, you know, he, he some of his stuff was a bit more challenging. But when I was when I was there, that was what I wanted to see. I wanted to see like him, uh, both both he and Daniel Balu. They were very open and happy to talk about why they were doing things, and um, there was a reason for everything Paul was doing. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't just, you know, a, an ingredient dartboard or, you know, he wasn't just, um, you know, a, a, a technique freak or anything. He, he, he did have um, a classical background. He also had a, you know, extraordinary understanding of modern techniques and he had a, an, an amazing uh, knowledge of an appreciation of, of food across the world. Um, and to bring that all together, I thought was just, uh, I thought it was terrific. So, um, he's, 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 he's taught me a lot. And I think just as a kind of, um, inspiration character, he's, uh, he's still, he's still very useful to refer back to. Not always, yeah. but, um, you know, it's kind of, if you're ever, if you're ever, you know, I don't know if you're ever looking for, <laughs> to go off off piece a little bit, you know what would Paul do? Right. <laughs> but I think I, you know, we try and we try and cook for the five fields now. Not really, you know. That's what I meant. Like at the start, you you, you do tend to imitate what other people are doing, and it never works. Yeah. <laughs> it never. You can it's never pull it off. Style after after a while, and and your head chef is Marguerite Koch. Marguerite Koch. Yeah. So how, how did you both meet? We met uh, when I was, she was the sous chef at Marcus Waring. She worked for Marcus for six years and uh, we became good friends. I was another grunt in the kitchen, um, you know, causing problems for people. And, uh, you know, we just became very good friends and uh, stayed in touch. And um, I knew she was, she was, you know, uh, kind of, uh, of, of, of around in London. So when this project became an option, I, I, I knew her, I'd worked with her, but I didn't know it, know her so well that, you know, it would be, you know, compromising some kind of friendship. Obviously we're, you know, more like siblings now. We've worked together here for seven years. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a, we have a, a, a very, you know, good relationship. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, it, it, it kind of worked. And she was senior enough to you know, help me set up the restaurant and uh, collaborate with, but not so much so that it wouldn't be interesting for her to leave her, her job in a way, if you see what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. And, and how, how does that work between you both? I mean, how much of a collaboration is it between you guys? I was very close. I mean, we, I, I, my the job I set myself now is just kind of is purely putting dishes on the menu and and just you know working on that. Marguerite has some on there. Charles, our sous chef, Van obviously in pastry. So we we do work together. I try and you know to to justify my existence, I try and make sure that the kind of lion's share of stuff that's going on the menu is 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 you know, stuff I've worked on. So um, otherwise I might as well just kind of stay. At home. <laughs> um, of but no, we're, we're, we're at a good, we're at a good point of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really happy with the team that we have and uh, Marguerite runs the kitchen incredibly efficiently. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really happy with that. We've got good people down there. So um, it does, it does take, so it does free up my day just to kind of, look at what we're going to put on next. And obviously the menu is quite a lot smaller now, so um, you can go on kind of deep dives into the stuff that's coming in from the gun. Sometimes it works, often it doesn't, but you know, 
but we eventually uh, managed to put something, uh, always something new. You know, I'm always, always keen to do something new, but I learn a lot from Marguerite and Charles and Van. Um, and, uh, you know, it's nice to be surrounded by people that you are still learning from. What is the story that, that you want to tell through your food? Still figuring that out, really. I, I, I you know, I think um, you want a you want a snapshot, a Polaroid of the season. I think vegetables do that really well. It's another reason, you know, they're so, you know, they're, they're, they're so good to to use in the kitchen because you can tell exactly what week of the year you're in by looking at the menu. Um, whereas, you know, if, it, if it's a if slightly more conventional menu, which is protein led, and you know, that could really be, you know, the, 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 there are very few proteins that are, are that specific um, to that part of that month. Um, so I think we're just trying to make you feel the weather. I like to use the weather a lot as an inspiration. So even if it's, Know, early October and it's sunny, which it isn't at the moment. You know, you can you can modify the dishes so that it feels a little bit lighter if you're having an Indian summer, for example. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Whereas if it's if it's turning, you can quickly you know, cook accordingly. Uh, have something a little bit more robust. Of dishes that are a bit more broad-shouldered, um, that 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 are more fitting for people's um, you know, predilections at the time. Mm. Um, but balance i think we like to you want you want that steady progression and i think you know just cooking the tasting menu now i understand that a bit more that that there has to be you know dishes do have to complement each other not just within the dish but across the menu um and you know just overfeeding people isn't that clever and it's not that difficult uh so you do, do have to be careful that you you're, you're, you're not just overloading people and the, with any kind of monotonous set, array of textures or, 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 you know, techniques where, where it gets kind of pappy and, you know, your palate gets tired, your waistline becomes stressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're here to feed people, of course, but you want yeah. it, you want, you, you want, um, you want it to coincide with the end of the meal that that kind of sense of satisfaction and yeah. Yeah, being full. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I actually, I love the attention to detail because you, um, in, in one of your dishes, you had this kind of succulent. It was like a little miniature succulent and they had like little kind of, I, I want to say water droplets, but it was like- I, Oh, the ice plant. Oh, it's just beautiful. I've never had anything like that before. Yeah, so we, we um, uh, David, uh, the gardener, he, he said to me uh, in his Belfast accent, "I won't try and do it. Uh, you're probably not going to. You're not probably not going to use these, are you?" And he'd been so excited about growing them, and I was struggling to, you know, get this set dish. Um, you know, but they'd just come in and get the balance right. It was it was a little bit. It was a little bit. You know, too heavy. I was trying to you know, lighten it a bit, and uh, and this. Um, you know, then, then I just remembered that, that they were going to flower, these little um, ice plants. Yeah. And uh, the buds, they do, they look like a cactus almost. Yeah. And uh, they've got this lovely solidity, like quite acidic, fresh, crunchy. Yeah. And uh, I would never have thought of it if we hadn't just spoken about it. So yeah, it's, there are some little candied walnuts on there, a kind of set ponzu gel and, uh, and these are lice plants and some, some um, you know, reindeer lichen on top. So it's, it's even though it's, uh, uh, the difficulty with that was giving that the dish texture yeah. because it, it, a set is quite a creamy thing. It's got these coconutty white chocolate tones to it. So it can get a bit tiring if you're having two dishes of it and uh you know it's just introducing that acidity that texture 
uh, and, and, and something, something unusual. So you opened in 2013, and it was three years until you received your Michelin star. Describe the moment that you found out. Really relieved, actually. We, uh, if, if, if I said that we weren't hoping for one, that would have been, that would be a, an outright outrageous lie. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think by the time we were uh, awarded the star, the restaurant was awarded a star, um, we felt we were ready to uh, live up to the award and uh, kind of, uh, and bear that responsibility. Cause it, I think it is a responsibility that, you know, it's a bit of a leap of faith that they take giving independent restaurants that they can't control these, uh, the, the you know, bestowing these, these awards. Um, so the, the restaurant has a lot to um, answer for when they do. So we, we've, we've always tried to um, exceed that, um, that, that, that rating, I guess. Really um, but, but no, it, it, it was great for business. It was great uh, professionally. We were really happy. I suppose it's easy to say now, but it, it, you know, it's not something we think about every day. Um, now, now it's like kind of like we uh, we sat down and we we're all we we're all thrilled and we said right well now we can actually get on with cooking. It's, <laughs> you know, it was great. So it was a, it was a bit of a weight off our minds. It was we felt almost when you have a you know a, a restaurant like this, you're responsible for it and and you don't have a star. There's a bit of pressure there and you know people. You, Kind of imagine people whispering in the back like oh dear you know yeah. but uh i that's never the case i now realize <laughs> and you know it's just a plus it's 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 nice to be awarded it but it's hard work you gotta you gotta you know and live up to the is, yeah it's not easy either no no it's uh it's uh, every day is different yeah uh and we try and make sure that that's they're not quite so different as they used to be, but uh, we, we, we are more consistent than we were at, you know, in 2016. And uh, I think we've grown up a lot and the restaurant has matured. And um, I think the guest experience has got better it's and we hope that we can improve it further. So um, even, <laughs> even to quote what I read at the bottom of every uh, newspaper article in these extraordinary times. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so what is it that makes you happier? Is it being in the moment of creating and cooking or is it the joy that someone gets from, from eating your food? Um, both. I think, uh, I think people become, I became a, a cook um, because uh, there's this instant gratification of seeing people enjoy what you've made and you don't have to be that patient. You have to be a bit patient, obviously, uh, making your dish or whatever it is. Um, uh, but once once it's ready to serve and you, you, you've, you've nailed it, the, the, it's, it's, it's a really addictive thrill uh, to see people just smiling and enjoying it. And I think you know, growing out of that, just enjoying being at the table with people and, you know, I think uh, as I've uh, as my time has become more stretched, I'm more appreciative of sitting down and sharing a meal with people than I was when I was 27. Yeah. Um, when you, you you don't have dependence and you, you seem to have a lot more time, I, I don't really feel like I have any time now. <laughs> so to actually enjoy a meal at a table is is just wonderful. Um, but yeah, creating is, is, is really fun too. And now I think rather than one-off, one-off dishes that, uh, that, that you, you, you're throwing together and you think, oh, fantastic. What a, what a moment of genius I've just had. I think, you know, a, a job well done and, uh, you know, the craft of, you know, putting it together, um, organizing how it's going to work, and sending it out on the first night and it not going up in a ball of flames, yeah. you know, that's very satisfying. Um, so, uh, yeah, but I, I think Matt and Jay, the general and restaurant manager, uh, probably get thoroughly sick of me pestering them. So, you know, 
what are they saying? What, you know, what are they, what are they, what are they, how do they like it? Well, they didn't say anything, but the plates are clean. So I'm guessing. You know, that, Always you gotta, so yeah, they, 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 it's still, it's still, yeah, the slightly, uh, slightly puerile, ex excitable, uh, you know, hassling. Of, what did they say? What did they say? Oh, I love it. I absolutely love that. So, so what is your earliest memory of food that spiked your, your love for it? Um, my mum's a really good cook, um, family style, tasty, um, not fussy, but you know, she, she's always cooked. She cooked all my meals when I was little. Um, I'm, I'm an only child and, uh, you know, everything was fresh. And so my dad and I were, you know, thoroughly spoiled. Um, but uh, nothing in particular. I think, I think, I, I guess, I, I guess I've thought about it a lot because I've been asked before um, that <laughs> A friend, a friend and I used to uh, you know, throw together potions from her spice cupboard and just tip everything into this. You know, so she'd come back and she'd be just incandescent because all her spices had made it into a big, horrible soup of <laughs> mess, like this like ghastly, foul-smelling paste. Right. And, uh, yeah, but it, yeah, I mean, we loved it. It was you know, every day and try and sneak off and, you know, um, Know, see what kind of potion we could make before my mum came running in and, <laughs> and fixed it <laughs> so yeah yeah exactly it went down the drain or in the bin or whatever <laughs> and so you're you're actually a history graduate and briefly became an accountant what was it that made you think I want to become a chef like I can I can you know make a yeah. profession out of this I I, I don't I don't think I'll be held up as a model alumnus by uh, by the university. You know, if you if you study, if you work hard at your history degrees, you can become a chef. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I was the world's worst accountant, so <laughs> that was a brief dalliance. Um, but I, you know, I was I was always greedy and uh, you know liked eating at restaurants. I like I, I I you know had done like holiday work when I was um, you know, and stages from. 15 onwards in in kitchens and restaurants and it was kind of right. i realized it was quite a good way to you know get attention from from girls and and then you know <laughs> even better excuse to say why why don't why don't you and so and so and so and so come over and i'll cook which was quite which was quite novel when you know we were 19. um so that that kind of worked my it worked, worked out well for you then <laughs> no, I, wasn't, I wasn't a very good cook but you know it's a, <laughs> And so, um, well, I guess, I guess your love for history is where, where the name for the restaurant came from. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, Firefields was the name of the area in Chelsea in Georgian times, where the restaurant is located today. And the produce was grown on the fields, which was then sold into central London. And, and Taylor, how interesting is it that you're now taking your fresh produce from out of town to the fields <laughs> that originally supplied it to London in the in the past. Yeah, I, it's uh, I, I from what, from what I know about the five fields, it was what I like. What I like about the name of the restaurant is uh, it, it's such a you know fancy part of town now, and uh, yeah. you know all, all all glitzy, and it's far removed from how the five fields was, which was this really ropey, awful place with you know hot, you get your throat slit quite easily and before, the, before the embankment was built um yeah this was part of the thames tidal tidal plain and flood plain so it's marshy and you know load of ne'er do wells i think uh, i think you know it was also part of you know, henry the eighth one of one of henry the eighth's many hunting estates down there by um, and uh, yeah, thomas moore I think he was a local boy as well. So, uh, um, yeah, it's quite, it's quite an interesting, an amazing quite an interesting idea. connection. But, uh, yeah, we struggled with the name until we started, you know, in desperation, we started looking at old maps and there were some good, um, good names on there, like Hell House and uh, <laughs> Bloody Bridge. And it gives well, you a flavour. call it Hell House. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mind you, there is Hill House. <laughs> yeah, there is, is, there is Hill, Hill House. On the road. 
Yeah, just up the track there, exactly. I see them in their uh, bright orange regalia, sort of marching around. Yeah, it used to be me. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, long, long time ago. But, um, nice, but yeah, nice, nice, that, nice that, that, school up there. Sorry? It's a nice school up there. Yeah, yeah, it was. I was there from, I think, from kindergarten to the age of, I think it was 10 or 11. Oh, small world, small world. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. And what I like yeah. about it is they've, they've got buildings all over, the, all over Chelsea. So you spend a lot yeah, of time moving from one to another. They must do, because I see these kids in, in throngs just, you know, they, <laughs> yeah. coming out of every doorway. Yeah, yeah. Right, well, we're, we're digressing. It's not about school. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, I just thought that was such an interesting, fun fact about, about the restaurant and the area that it's in and that you're, you know, you're actually supplying it from your own garden. So, so yeah. And so you've also named your private dining room after John Raku, who mapped out the area in Georgian times, which I find super interesting as well. But tell us what your thought process was behind naming the room, the room after John Raku. Um, he was, he was the, um, I think he was the, he was the cartographer. He was the, he was the guy who produced the, the, the map. I'm sorry, you may yeah. have just said that. Um, so yeah, again, the, 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 the desperate, uh, scanning and scrutiny of maps <laughs> helped us out. And we've actually got, I don't think it's, it used to be in here, um, uh, an original, Oh, no. it's, a, it's a print it's a print of uh, one of his original uh maps of you know chelsea and and the five fields is on there and i think he's the one who included the details about uh, hell house and bloody bridge and um actually i, I, I did, did pimlico didn't quite make it in but i was born on tatchbrook street which i learned that in, in i don't know if this is true but someone said in, in you know middle english it means shit creek so um <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> Again, you know, they, they weren't they weren't shy with their uh, with their street names. <laughs> no, they weren't. And actually, I, I even had a look on good old Wiki. Um, actually, had a look at the map by by John Raku, and it was broken up into mul multiple sheets. And I think you are actually on sheet A three, and I'm on G three, <laughs> which is South London. Um, so yeah, I was going to ask you if you've got an original map there. So so yeah, I think that's that's pretty yes. cool if you've got. It's I think I think an image of the original map or a print anyway, um, yeah. but but I I doubt I doubt I don't think it's the original. I, I would be uh, I, yeah, I, I, I'd, yeah. I'd give it, I'd give it back if it was the. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's so inspiring for people looking at building concepts. I love I love the way that you've come up with that, and it's it's interesting. It's an interesting and different way to look at things. Um, but while we're on the subject of inspiration, what, what kind of advice would you give to a young aspiring chef of today? Oh, um, yeah, eat out, eat out as much as you can. Um, expose yourself to as many different styles of food as you can, because it's not a, a one size fits all. Uh, you can learn a lot from eating other people's food. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's such a, such an exciting uh, world and uh, expressed so beautifully by so many people. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful industry, but don't get, don't get sort of siphoned into one, one you know, um, direct, in, in one direction, in one, in one um, lane. It's, uh, there's a lot of cross-pollination from people. One, one regret that I have is that I never worked in a kind of high volume kind of brasserie you know get them in get them out and you know i think i think that's a i think that's useful for everyone um at some point in their career to to work in you know, both you know low covers high end and um middle market high volume I, I, you know I, you, you learn a lot learn a lot of bad habits almost anywhere you go it turns out <laughs> As I've, found, as I've learned over the over the years and observed, but um, <laughs> I, I, I think it's just, I think I think it's just the yearning to have some kind of kitchen confidential experience. Maybe I, you know maybe maybe that's maybe that's poor advice. <laughs> 
Oh, I think it's great advice, actually. It's, it's, um, it's pretty cool, I think. And I think eating out is so important and, you know, discovering different flavors and, and tastes and the way people yeah. operate and the way they work. And would you recommend to anyone that, you know, would be thinking of opening a restaurant, would you recommend jumping in the way that you did? No. <laughs> no. I, uh, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, recommend doing that. That was, um, you know, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't ready. Um, and I didn't have the, uh, I didn't have the business acumen or the, or the, um, you know, the culinary ability at the time. And, you know, one inevitably suffers at, at the hand of the other. If, if it's like that, you do need to, you know, at least, at least have a bit more uh, time under your belt cooking um, in my case. And then, you know, surround yourself with good people though. Um, and I, 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 that I did and um, you know, it's paid dividends, but you also need to know your, your weaknesses and your shortcomings that, you know, you can't be everyone's everything all the time. And no one, God knows, I'm, you know, no one's perfect. So, yeah. You know, there, there are, there are things that you need, you need to lean on other people as well and, and, you know, don't micromanage them and, 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 you know, it's not one person. It's a, it's a, it's like an organism, a restaurant. It's like a, you know, the, the, the kitchen is the kind of one of the vital organs and the, and the, you know, the front of house team is, you know, the, the, the kind of the, the mouth and the right hand and, um, I don't know, you know, the, 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 the porters are the, are the joints and, uh, you know, the, the wrists and, you know, mate, facilitating all of this stuff. And, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a, it's a small, it's like a ship. Yeah. You know, it's I, like, a, like a kind of man of war ship. Yeah. It's quite interesting the way you, the way you're actually painting that picture. I've never looked at it in sort of, you know, human bio biology sort of, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that's pretty cool. And yeah you're all you know it's like you're all one person you know yeah and you have to you have to you have to the same way. work in in synchrony really um yeah because if, if you've got if you've got the outliers who aren't who aren't really marching to the you know beat of that drum then it becomes pretty clear and yeah yeah you, you do you do have to work very closely together it's it's uh i always think it's like one of those leaky buckets and team building that you have to try and plug with your fingers and yet there are always leaks yeah. no matter how well you <laughs> fill the gaps and it's the same with a restaurant you know there's always something that needs doing and there's always something that's about to go wrong if if not going wrong at that very moment um that needs your attention so yeah. you have and to be so you, you mentioned um you know eating out is still a really is a really good thing to do and is it something that you still do on a regular basis or not as much as I'd like. Um, but I, I do, I, I, my wife is wise to me now. She's, she's, she knows that at any given opportunity will, will end up sitting down for like a 10,000 calorie feast <laughs> somewhere. And, yeah. and you know, so she, she closely monitors my, the reservations I make for us. Our honeymoon was, was, <laughs> It's the least romantic honeymoon ever, you know, just because it was just one silly restaurant after another, one amazing restaurant after another. But where was where were you? We were out in. She's American, so we we, we got married in Utah, and our honeymoon was in Napa and uh, San Francisco. Yeah. So we we we, you know, I, I <laughs> made sure that we hit five consecutive, you know, over the top restaurants on our honeymoon and by the time <laughs> by that's the time amazing we, that's a brilliant honeymoon i know i know <laughs> uh, you know uh, such, such an ingrate she is um, <laughs> but uh, no it, we, we did kind of pass the pain threshold so no i don't get to eat as as much as i'd like uh okay. now but uh, you know any excuse <laughs> any and it doesn't matter what kind of restaurant it is uh, it could be, could be, you know, something quite humble, or it could be, you know, ideally something where it's totally hedonistic. But you know, I don't always get my way. <laughs> and do you have a favourite in London? Um, 
No, I've got four or five favorites, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name names. They pro- probably they could probably tell you themselves, like you know. <laughs> the one, but, and you, you don't want to. Before I became a cook, it was easier to, you know, go to restaurant. But before I before I was sort of, you know, uh, known, I guess in in, in London, uh, I, I doubt I am even now. But I. Um, it was easier to go to restaurants regularly. Uh, and now it, it is a, it's a sort of professional obligation not to go too much to right. someone else's restaurant. You know, it's just kind of feels like kind of corporate espionage or something, which it's not. It's just because I really like going and, yeah. you know, um, but you don't want to show up every week. <laughs> <laughs> the downside of being a known chef. <laughs> oh, for me and on, on other places yeah that that's never thought of it that way but yeah that is that is a bit of a shame but i hear you have a rather eclectic taste in music the brian jonestown massacre oh how'd you know that uh-huh. <laughs> do my research <laughs> um yeah i, I, I don't yeah I, i'm waiting for live music to come back as well like that, that would be that would be wonderful yeah uh, so, so you hadn't seen them you haven't seen them live before no, I've seen them a lot. I've seen them, you know. seen them like? No, I've traveled all over to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like, you know, a, a hysterical groupie, but uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good night out. They're always, uh, yeah, they always put on a good show. and uh, You never know kind of what, what version of the band you're going to get or what kind of mood they're in, whether they'll play for four hours or play for one hour. It's, uh, I think they, they too have become and it's really one guy but they've become a lot more mellow right. with age so you don't get you don't get all the kind of all the bullshit that, uh, <laughs> that kind of ruins a gig actually to be honest but uh no, yeah. great great music not not great to put on in the kitchen because it's a bit you know jangly and distorted and you know, <laughs> Yeah, I must I admit, I listened, I listened for a little bit and I was like, this is interesting, it's interesting, it's, you know, I think you kind of, you know, you can get used to it. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 I get, it's quite eclectic, some of it, yeah, but, you know, he's quite, he likes to, uh, you know, um, toy around with different genres and very prolific, you know, so again, Anton Newcomb, great inspiration, professionally, not personally. <laughs> 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 well, what other what other um, inspirations do you have in the chef world? Oh, um, who are your big inspirations there? Oh, I like I like anyone who 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 you know who demonstrably loves what they do. Um, you know, starting with my own colleagues. Uh, you know, it's great to see them enjoying their work. Hopefully, enjoying their work. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know. I always think Brett Graham is a is a sort of reference point for you know, anyone in our industry. Just works incredibly hard. Um, I don't know him that well. Um, I've met him a number of times, but you know everything I see, he he, he does it you know one hundred and ten percent. There are no he doesn't half ass anything, and and I think that's you know something something that everyone should aim for. I, I don't often achieve it to be honest you know but i think there are a few who do but i think he's a great he's a great um figurehead um as as one example there are many but uh you know any anyone who 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 sticks at it with with one restaurant essentially and you know obviously he's got a pub but makes that a, a a lifelong project i hope the library comes back um you know i hope that this to see what what happens next and maybe he'll be you know, starting a new, a new restaurant and just, you know, kind of. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly travel there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I might exactly. even drag my wife along. If she is. <laughs> Poor girl. you got to be in disguise though. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you imagine if my wig fell, even, even worse, if your disguise is, uh, is revealed. Uh, you know. <laughs> So like that you, mad New York Times critic who used to dress <laughs> up and have the restaurants. Yeah, that would be hilarious. Oh. <laughs> that would be brilliant. So, Taylor, it's been amazing getting to know you. Just, I have one last question for you, though. Tell me something about yourself that I couldn't possibly know. 
bearing in mind I'm great at research. <laughs> There's no, I've got, I, 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 I kept a police caution from a few years ago, but that, you know, maybe that's a little too, too serious. I did, I spent, uh, I spent a night after, after a late evening with friends, I spent a night swimming down river against the incoming tide from Putney Bridge to Chelsea Bridge wow. in the So I was in there from about 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. <laughs> That's quite funny. What, what possessed you to do that? I tried to walk all the way home along the river and the path runs out somewhere just under Putney Bridge. <laughs> and, uh, so I ended up leaping across. This was a long time ago. I ended up leaping across people's um, kind of walls just above the sluice and I, I, I lost my footing and fell in the river oh. and I couldn't get out if I'd gone about 150 yards back I could have climbed out but I was tired and emotional after my late <laughs> session with friends and I, I thought right well I, I'm gonna keep it well head yeah the good thing about the Thames is right under right under the waterline because it was high tide as well it was coming in there's chicken wire all the way along. So I was able to drag myself for about, you know, I'd say 800, 900 yards quite easily. And then I had to get out into the main uh, part of the river to get around the trees and you know, <laughs> part of the boating clubs and stuff. So That is brilliant. <laughs> Probably about as close to death as I've been, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, you made it. Well done. That is, that is actually, that's such a brilliant story. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> I'm interested in the police caution though. Uh, oh, I was, uh, I was, um, I had my, <laughs> I had my earphones in. Uh, it might surprise you to learn it was a lovely late evening. I was on my knees with my earphones in with, and eyes closed playing some really good air guitar in the middle of the road. And unfortunately, fortunately, the, the next car that came along was a police car. And I, I denied all accountability. So they threw, they threw me in the drunk tank for the night. Oh, my God. They gave me an 85 pound fine. Uh, again, a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I've, well, that's I've kept, pretty harsh. Uh, yeah, I know. I've, I, I, you know, I, I, was, I, I thought I was absolutely charming, but not charming enough to uh, <laughs> avoid a, a, a night in the cell. Oh no! <laughs> yeah. Oh well, but it sounds like that—that that is actually a really good story. I like that one. It's quite funny. It sounds like you've got lots of them, so we're going to have to do this again. <laughs> Hopefully, no more to come. I think that's probably it for me. Yeah, but, uh, late, you know. late night stories from Taylor Bonnyman. <laughs> oh. <laughs> fireside, fireside stories. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been so much fun chatting with you. Unfortunately, Taylor is not on social media. However, you can follow The Five Fields, which is the restaurant, on Instagram. And I'm at Posh Nosh Gal, and also now on podcast. So uh, thanks again, Taylor. Take thank care. you. It was lovely to meet you. And you. Speak soon. Take care. Cheers. Bye.